Now, I'm just going to introduce the speaker. Um, some of you may have seen him speak before. I've seen him speak in something like three, three different continents and so many countries, it's incredible. Um, Simon, up until recently, was a uh, evangelist for Oracle on the, on the Java stuff um, and uh, has moved to a very shiny new job where he's now deputy CTO of Azure Systems. And this guy talks at conferences all over the world and um, attendees love his stuff. So um, introducing Simon Ritter, really hope that you'll enjoy it. Thanks. Okay. Let's save the applause for afterwards. Um, right, so what I'm going to talk about this morning, I've got 43 minutes to talk about JDK 9. So quick show of hands. So who's using JDK 8 at the moment? Okay, good. Who's using JDK 7? Okay, JDK 6? Okay, anybody JDK 5? Yeah. Ah, okay, anybody older than JDK 5? <laughs> Stop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you work for Oracle anyway. Right. Um, so what I'm going to do in this session is really go, and go through the, the highlights of, uh, of what JDK 9 promises, uh, given that we're still about a year, just over a year away from JDK 9 being released. So clearly what I'm going to talk about is what's the current list of things that will go in JDK 9. There will be some changes before the actual release, I'm sure. Right. Now, uh, quick side. Um, I'm getting better at this, but I do have to put this slide up because I do tend to talk a lot about we do this and we do that because I've worked for Oracle for a long time. And so when I say we, I actually mean them, as in Oracle. So I just, you know, I will try to avoid uh, talking about it like I work for Oracle still. Okay, key features that are going into JDK 9. Um, in terms of the features, most of what's happening in terms of changes is more around the structure of Java, the platform, rather than Java, the language. If you look at JDK 8, there was this big thing, lambdas and streams, which gave us more functional style of programming in Java. With JDK 9, we're not talking about big changes to the language. We're not talking about big changes to the APIs. Well, maybe somewhat, but we'll talk about that in more detail. So it's, it's really about the platform. And the key thing here is Project Jigsaw. Modularization of the Java platform, modularization of applications where you want to. So that's, that's one of the things I'm going to talk about. I'll talk a little bit about developing code using modules. Um, another thing that's been included in JDK 9 is JShell, which is a REPL. Um, so I'll talk about that in, uh, as we go through. And then there's a few smaller changes that uh, I'll just mention, things that are being proposed and some of the interesting things that are going to be included. Right, so let's start with structural changes to the API because this is actually quite significant and it's quite important because it does have an impact on current applications when you're moving them to JDK 9. So these are things that you do need to be a little bit aware of so that when you're migrating applications to JDK 9, you know about what's going to be uh, impacting you. <coughs> now, the first thing is the way that APIs are classified. One of the things that you find with Java, if you go right back to the beginning, JDK 1.0, there were about 200 classes in the class library. And I remember back then thinking to myself, right, 200 classes, that's good because I can hold all of them in my head. So I can actually know all of the APIs and so when I'm programming, I know what I'm using. Now over time, we've obviously, they've obviously added things to the API and we've got to the point where we have JDK 8, which has a bit over 4,000 classes in RT.jar. This is good because obviously it means there's lots of things like you, know, you don't have to write a list, you don't have to write a set, you don't have to write SQL code in terms of like uh, interacting with a database. All of those things are provided for you as standard libraries. But it does mean there's a lot of things to try and remember. And it also means that there's a lot of things that are there which, because they're part of RT.jar, you can use, even though in theory you're not supposed to. So there's, there's what we have in terms of supported APIs, and then there is unsupported APIs. So if we look at supported APIs, there are ones that come directly from the Java specification. 
the, the JSRs that are created, which define exactly what Java SE is. So these are the ones that you find in java.star, javax.star packages. We all know them, we use them, great. Then there are some other publicly supported, publicly available APIs, which are part of the JDK. So they fall outside of the Java SE specification, but you're free to use them because they're there and they are supported. There's things like com.sun.star, which are primarily ones that are used by tools. So some of the um, you know, IDE tools, um, deployment tools, things like that, actually make use of these APIs. And then there's some JDK dot star APIs, which are used by things like Project Nashorn, which is the idea of JavaScript running on the JVM. Again, publicly supported, so you can use them. But then there's these unsupported ones, which are not intended for public use. And these mostly fall into the sun.star packages. And the most infamous of these is the sun.misc.unsafe. I always like to point this out. There is a clue in the name. But anyway, now, in terms of compatibility, Oracle have, and Sun before them have always been very focused on the idea of maintaining backward compatibility. And the way I like to put this is there's nothing worse than taking code that you've written and works and having to modify it to make it work on a new platform because you're just wasting time because it already works. So the idea is that any code, any application, which uses supported APIs on version N of Java should work on version N plus one, even without recompilation. And there's very few places where that's actually been broken. Um, really, the, the kind of main one was very early on, back in sort of JDK 1.0.2 and, and JDK 1.1. There were some incompatible changes between the, the way the bytecodes um, the structure of the class files and things, so that you couldn't actually run 1.0 code on a newer VM. But most of the time you can do that. There are a few things where compatibility has been broken by changes to the language, the introduction of assert, um, assertions in JDK 1.4, um, introduction of enumerations in JDK 5. These broke backward compatibility because you couldn't use enum, you couldn't use assert as a, a variable name. Um, the other thing is deprecation. And again, if you look at the history of Java, right back in version 1.1, the deprecated tag was introduced so that Sun and subsequently Oracle could let developers know that these APIs were no longer recommended for use. And in future, they could be removed from the JDK. And if you look, there's actually 23 classes that have been deprecated, 18 interfaces, and 379 methods. Of those, not one single one has actually been removed yet. So we're in a situation where you know, we still use all of the, the ones that we, we want to. It's just you know, some of them are deprecated. Now, for JDK 9, there will be some incompatible changes between JDK 9 and JDK 8. First of those is about encapsulation of JDK internal APIs. And I will talk about that in the next couple of slides so you understand more about what I'm, I'm talking about with that. Um, there will be a small number of APIs actually removed. So this is different to what's been done in the past. Will actually be all of six methods being removed from the APIs. These are all property change listeners um, Really, I don't quite understand why those six have been singled out, but I think it's to do with the links between different modules in terms of the, the underlying platform. These have already been highlighted in Java SE 8, so they've been deprecated, and um, so they're actually going to be removed in JDK 9. Um, another thing that's going, to do, uh, that's going to happen is change the binary structure of the Java runtime itself. Um, I've got a couple of slides about that later on, so we'll talk about that in a bit more detail. There is a new version string format that might catch a few people out if you're depending on a particular structure of how you define which version or how you detect which version of Java is being used. That's going to change a little bit, so you may have to change your code for that. And there's one small change here, which is a single underscore is no longer going to be allowed as an identifier in source code. Hands up anybody who's used a single underscore as an identifier. 
good. Nobody, because I was going to say that's very bad. <laughs> okay. Now, here's an interesting thing. Oracle did some analysis of a large set of their own internal application code, and they looked at what were the most popular unsupported APIs that they had used. Now, I guess you could argue that because they're Oracle, you know, they own the platform or they, they are the custodians of the platform, so they're entitled to use the internal ones. But strictly speaking, you know, for application code, they should be following the same rules as everybody else, so they shouldn't be using these APIs. Anybody want to guess what the number one most popular unsupported API used by Oracle was? Anybody? Oh, very good. Well done. Base64 encoder was the number one most used unsupported API. Second most popular one. I've only got three, so I'm not going to keep going for too long. Okay, the second most popular one was sun.misc.unsafe. This is a very popular unsupported API. And then the third one is, fairly logically, Base64 decoder. There were a bunch of other ones as well, but these were the top three uh, that they had used unsupported. Now, when it comes to internal API, internal APIs, what has been decided is that they're going to be classified in two different ways. So there's going to be what are called non-critical APIs and critical APIs. And this is really as a result of a lot of feedback from the community, because originally the idea was that all unsupported APIs in JDK 9 were going to be encapsulated, meaning that they were no longer going to be visible to any application code. And the logic there was, well, you know, we've told everybody for the last 20 years that they shouldn't be using these APIs, so it's your own lookout. If you are using them, you shouldn't be doing it, so tough luck. That didn't go down too well, so this is the, the plan now. Non-critical APIs are ones that basically have little or no use outside of the JDK. They really are very internal, very specific to the JDK, and nobody really needs to use them outside of that. The other ones are ones that are used for convenience. Base64 encoder, Base64 decoder. reason that that's for convenience is that since JDK 8, there is now a public API version of that, so you can easily switch to using the public API rather than the internal one. Then critical ones are ones which have functionality that would be difficult, if not impossible, to implement outside of the JDK. And that's where unsafe comes in because it's you know very low level, allows you to manipulate memory at uh, you know a low level. So it's one that you couldn't particularly implement yourself outside of the JDK. And there is a, a JEP, a JDK Enhancement Proposal, number 260, which says that for JDK 9, what is going to happen is all non-critical JDK internal APIs will be encapsulated. So those are the ones that we don't really kind of care about. All critical JDK APIs for which there is a supported replacement will also be encapsulated. So if there is an alternative that people can easily switch to, then they'll be encapsulated. So base64 encoder, decoder, okay. Um, that means that if you're using those, you will have to change your code to recompile it and make it work on JDK 9. The big thing is that they're not going to encapsulate cert the critical JDK internal APIs in JDK 9. These will be deprecated in JDK 9, so people will be made aware that they will be removed in a future version, and then either they'll be encapsulated or removed completely in JDK 10, but alternatives will be provided as a replacement as supported APIs. And really the thing there is that looking at things like unsafe, there's a lot of work going on within Oracle to figure out how can the functionality of unsafe be exposed in a public API and allow people to use that kind of functionality without exposing them to sort of big problems. Um, in terms of the, the critical APIs which are going to be accessible still, these are the six which are kind of most important. Unsafe is obviously uh, one of those. There's a couple to do with signal handling. This is basically if you want to handle signals from the operating system. So if you wanted to say, okay, somebody hits control C on your Java application and you don't want it to exit, then you can track the signal and actually do something with it. Um, Sun.mist.cleaner, that's for handling uh, finalization of 
objects. If you don't want to use a finalizer, then there's a kind of more flexible way of doing that. You can tidy up things. And then there's a couple of things to do with reflection. Um, the get caller class gives you the, um, the call stack, basically, so you can figure out where you're coming from. To make life easier for you, there is a way of reviewing your own code. There is a, a tool that was introduced in JDK 8. There's JDEPS. Um, as I say, this was introduced in JDK 8. It's being enhanced in JDK 9 to add some new features. Um, there's already a, a Maven JDEPS plugin, so you can use that. And you can say, OK, I've got my application in a jar file, run JDEPS on it, and it'll give you a list of the things that it actually depends on. So that's a good way of finding out whether you've got dependencies on things which would be a problem in JDK 9. So let's look at Project Jigsaw and a module system. So the first thing is, what were the goals for Project Jigsaw? Now, first of these was to make Java SE more scalable and more flexible. With the deployment of Java at the moment, we have or had in the past Java Micro Edition, which was really aimed at very small devices. Java SE is now getting to the point where the, the hardware is catching up so that you can really run Java SE on, on any sort of even small device. But in order to kind of fit it into a small footprint, we need the ability to reduce the number of APIs. You know, no embedded application, no real application, is going to use all 4,000 of the available APIs. So why don't we shrink it down so that you can select which bits you need from the standard classes and then build a runtime from that which is smaller than the full runtime. So that makes it more sc scalable, more flexible. It's also about improving security, improving maintainability and performance. And there's a lot of talk about if you minimize the number of APIs that are available for an application to use, you're minimizing the security surface. So it's difficult, harder for people to actually attack things. Uh, makes it easier to maintain. Again, performance. If you've got less classes to load at startup time, you can improve the, the speed of startup. Also about simplifying the construction, deployment, and maintenance of large-scale applications. So we're looking at how to modularize the platform, but also how to modularize applications on top of that. Now, in terms of specifications, it's, it's quite interesting because there's been several kind of attempts at this. So there was JSR, what was it, 277, I think it was. And then there was uh, 291. And yeah, 277, 291, and 294, all of which were kind of previous attempts at modularizing the, the Java platform. And the current one is JSR 376, which is what Project Jigsaw has become. Um, there's going to be a new JSR for Java SE 9, obviously, which will include JSR 376, um, and then there'll be modularization of the APIs as well. And then there's a whole bunch of these JDK enhancement proposals around different things to do with the JDK, because these are bits of functionality which uh, actually fall outside of the Java SE specification. Fundamentals of modules then. So a module is kind of like a package in a way. So we use packages to group together classes. And a module is a way of grouping together pieces of code that we want to treat in a single unit. And if you look at Java, then what you're really dealing with is a collection of packages. So you can have multiple packages in a module. Package can have multiple classes and so on. And if we want to, we can include other things in a module. So it's flexible enough that it's not just code. We can actually have things like native code in there. If we want to have JNI and we want some native libraries, we can include that. We can have resource files. We can have configuration data. All of these things can be placed in a module. So we end up with the basic idea where you've got this module, which we're going to call Zoop. And it's going to contain a set of packages, which are alpha and beta. In order to declare the module, to make it usable, we need some way of saying what this module is, what its name is, and some details about it. And to do that, we create a module info.java file. And that becomes part of the, the module itself. 
So in its simplest form, we can simply say module, and then the name of the module, com.azul.zoop, set of curly braces, and that's it. That's all we need to put in in order to create a module. That identifies it as having a particular name. We create a jar file with the necessary compiled classes in it, and that's our module. But things get a bit more complicated because we need to understand about dependencies. We could have a situation where our module com.azul.zoop depends on packages which are in a different module. So we have a module called Zeta. There's a dependency between the two. So Zoop needs to understand that it depends on Zeta. To do that, within our module info.java file, we simply add a line which says requires com.azul.zeta. And that way, when the code is being linked together and, and uh, resolved, we know that there's a dependency, and so we can follow that dependency, find the classes, and everything will compile. We can also include dependencies on the standard Java classes. And these have been divided up into modules. We'll, we'll come back to the, the way that's happened a little bit later on. But there are modules within the standard Java classes. We've taken all those 4,000 classes. We've divided them up into modules and name them accordingly based on what they do. So you've got java.sql, java.awt, things like that. So we can have a dependency on a standard piece of the Java platform. So it requires java.sql. What this allows us to do is to construct a module dependency graph. So now we have our application, which depends on our module zoop. Module zoop depends on zeta and Mod, our app also dep on, depends on java.sql. All modules have a dependency on java.base. This is like just the, you know, the, the minimum set of classes which are required by every module. And so it's kind of like the, the object, if you like, in terms of classes. So object is the superclass of all classes, ultimately. And all modules ultimately depend on java.base. And then because java.sql will have dependencies, so it depends on XML, it depends on logging, we can fill those in as well. So this gives us a nice graph, we can follow all the dependencies, we can compile our code, we can resolve all the dependencies as we're linking, and we have an application. But then we have to understand about the fact that there is readability versus dependency. I have a situation where I've got my app, which depends on the SQL module, and the SQL module depends on logging. Okay, that's fine. But what I could end up with is a piece of code like this. So in my application, I create a driver, and that's from the, the SQL module. The driver, because it has a dependency on logging, is able to expose an API, which allows me to get access to the logger. So I call the logger, and I try and log some message. The problem with that is that the dependency is between SQL and logging, not between app and logging. So there's no direct dependency between app and logging, which means that we would have to actually say explicitly in our app, well, okay, we want also to depend on logging. But that's a bit complicated because it means we, we need to understand if we're going to depend on SQL that we also need to depend on logging. So that's not very kind of helpful. To get around that problem, what we can do is we can allow the java.sql module, which is what it does, to export the dependency that it has. So what we do here is we say that java.sql requires java.logging, but it does it in a public way, which means that it depends on the logging module, and it also makes all of the APIs within the logging module available to anybody who is dependent on java.sql. So when we want to use the logger, the, the compiler can resolve that because it knows that anything that's in logging is being made available by SQL as well. So there's no need for us to explicitly say that app depends on logging. This then allows us to fill in the readability graph rather than the dependency graph so that we end up with a situation where our app depends on java.sql, which depends on XML and logging, but those are readable by our application code. 
So anything in logging, anything in XML can be used by our app code, even though it's not explicitly stating a requirement on those. The requirement comes through java.sql. Now the next thing we can do is to define visibility. Rather than saying that everything in our module is being made available as public things that can be used by another module that's dependent on it, we can say, well, we want certain things to be public, certain things to be private. So in this case, what we can say is com.azul.zoop exports zoop alpha, exports zoop beta, so those are available to anything that is dependent on that module. But in the case of zoop theta, we don't export that, so it won't be visible to modules which are dependent on zoop. So we won't be able to use that. So we can specify what things we want to export, what things we want to keep private. It's very much the same way that we have within the public-private way of exposing methods and classes and, and variables. Now, in order for something to be accessible, there's this two-way thing that we need to actually understand. So for a package to be visible, firstly, it has to be exported by a module. So if it's not exported, it's not going to be visible no matter what we do with it. So as so long as we export it and the module that wants to use it has a dependency on the module that contains it, then we can use that package. So there's that, that idea of a two-level thing. One, it has to be exported, and then it has to have a dependency. So it's like saying we have to import it as well. What this does is changes things a bit, because if we look at the, the way that Java covers accessibility, we've always been used to the idea of four levels of accessibility. So the, the most open, we have public. It's available to anybody. Then we've got protected, which means that we can make those things available to subclasses. We've got package protection, so if we don't specify anything, then we can use those things within classes of the same package. And then we've got private, which is where we can use them only in that particular class. So these are well understood concepts in Java. That's going to change in JDK 9. And this is where, like I say, this is one of the things that's quite significant. Because now we're going to have public to everyone, we're going to have public but only to specific modules and then we're going to have public but only within a module because if you think about it you could have a class which is public you could have public members of it you could have public methods but if you don't export it from that module you're not going to be uh, able to access it outside so even though it's part of your application you won't be able to access that class from other parts of the application so it's still public but only within the module. It's no longer public within the whole application. And that is, like I say, it's, it's a change to the way that we're used to dealing with code, because normally you would think, all oh, right, I'm going to use this class, it's a public class, it's got a public method, I want to access that, so you just access it. Now, you will have to make sure that the module that contains that class exports that, the package that contains that class in order for you to use it, and you need to create the dependency between your application and that module. So you've got the idea of public to everyone where you can say, yep, yeah, it's public to everybody or public within a module, public to any specific modules. So public is no longer meaning fully accessible in the way that it was before. Like I say, it, it's something that you will just have to be aware of when you're um, dealing with code in JDK 9. What this has led to is, um, an eye chart test. This is a good test of your, your, your vision here. Don't worry too much about the, the actual words on here, but this is the platform modules that have been created for JDK 9 through Project Jigsaw. And so at the bottom, those of you with good eyesight may be able to see that there's java.base, and then there's a whole range of modules around that. So there's java.xml, there's java.naming, transaction, good old java.corba, because we do like Corba, and various other ones. And what this allows you to do is to select which bits of the 
the JDK class libraries you want to use in your application. And there's also the, the things that are, were introduced in JDK 8, which was the compact profiles. So there's a compact 1, a compact 2, and a compact 3, which were the profiles introduced in JDK 8. So you can kind of migrate easily if you started using the, the profiles in JDK 8. Let's talk a little bit about how you can use modules to develop code and how you can actually take your code and, and modularize it. So the first thing is compiling your code. Uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. If you want to compile your code as a module, as I said, what you need is a module info.java file. So you create your module info.java file, and then you simply compile your code, and you generate class files. So you get a module info.class, and you get your normal class files. If you then want to compile using modules, then in the same way that we have a class path, where we can determine where classes are being resolved from, we now also have a module path. Now, as, as one of these things where you know people talk about class path hell because you have these massive like lists of, of places to get class, um, classes from in the class path. So we're moving away from class path hell. Class path hell will go away. Welcome to module path hell. It, no, it's not as bad as that. It, it is going to be simpler. Honest. Um, so you end up with Java C, and then you can specify a module path, which is where the modules are going to be resolved from. So directories where you can pick up the modules that you need for your application. Compiling with the module path, what you do now is you say, OK, I need to pull in modules for my application from these directories. So I specify a module path where I'm going to get them from. And then you say, I want to output my module to a directory, or my code to a directory. So I'm compiling these into that, and so I end up with a module info.class and a uh, class file compiled from my code. Then if you want to execute it, same way that you would have done before, you would have specified a class path, now you specify a module path. So you can say java minus mp, because module path thankfully can be abbreviated to minus mp, and you can specify where the modules are coming from. You can then specify the module that you want to use, or in fact, the main class that you want to use. So you can say module comes from app. That's the module that's going to provide the main class. And then the actual main class is going to be com.azul.app.main. And that way, when the code executes, it will execute from main, pulling in the modules from the mods directory. Now, that, that seems like it's very similar to what we do at the moment in terms of, okay, I could probably replace minus MP with minus CP and not really see a whole lot of difference there. Um, but uh, I don't have time to go through all the, the, the details of modularizing everything in this presentation, but if you, okay, yes, I've got 10 minutes left. Okay, so I don't have t time to go through all the details of modularizing everything, but you can get to a, a point where you don't have to do all of this. You can kind of shrink it down. You can have one module, and then you can just run your application. And we get to the point where you no longer have to actually specify Java minus MP, anything. You can just say, run my application. And that's really kind of the... Um, the, the goal of, of all of this. Um, you can get diagnostics, so you can say, okay, um, look at my application code, give me some information about what's being resolved from where, so you can find out which classes are coming from which modules and, and things like that. Uh, packaging with modular jars. There was a proposal a while back for things called JMods. That's kind of gone away, so they're still going to use jar files. And if you want to create a modular jar file, then what you need to do is obviously put the module info.class file into your jar file. So you can do something like jar create uh, the file you want to create as a jar, so app.jar. Specify the main class, so it'll pick it up from there, and where the modules are coming from. And then you can get information about that, because you can now, there's a minus p option on jar, which will print out information. So you go jar minus file uh, app.jar minus p, and it'll give you the name of the module, and then it will tell you what the requirements of that module are. So in this case, it depends on Zeta, it depends on Java base, which is mandated because everyone has to depend on that, and java.sql. And it also has a main class associated with it, so you know what that is. And then if you want to execute that, you can say, okay, 
module path. Uh, okay, in this case, it's going to be some library and some mods as well. And then now you don't have to specify the module, the where the main class comes from, because it already knows, and you can just say, okay, execute main. But as I say, that that will actually get simpler um, as you go through some of the other steps. Linking. Um, Java now has the concept of linking, which is probably a little bit misleading because it's not linking in the same way that if you take C code and you, you compile it and then you link it. Uh, what linking does is to create a runtime distribution for you. So you can say, okay, link, jlink with a module path where you're going to get the, the JDK mods from, so modules for the JDK. Um, you've got some additional mods which you want to specify and you've got an image that you want to come out of there. And what that will do is actually, that way, it will create a modular runtime image. So it will create a JRE in effect for you with the Java, Java binary, the libraries, the configuration files and all that stuff. And you can do um, Java minus list mods and that will tell you what mod modules are actually in that particular um, runtime. In this case, we've only specified one, which is Java base, so there's not really a lot in there. But if you go a little bit further, you can say, okay, I'm going to link my application, and then when you do list mods, you actually end up with the modules from the JDK, which, are which you are dependent on, so base, logging, SQL, and XML, and also the modules from your application that you're dependent on, so app, Zoop, and Zeta. What this also includes is some very nice things, version numbering. So you get all excited, you look at this and you go, ooh, version numbering, now we can do versioning of our application code. Don't get too excited. This is for information purposes only. It has no bearing on what the compiler does, it has no bearing on what gets resolved in terms of when you execute your code. So it's really there just to look nice. Um, it would be nice if there was some practical use to this, but apparently that's beyond the scope of the Jigsaw project at the moment. A uh, few smaller changes in terms of JDK 9. Uh, as I mentioned, there's JShell, which is the this REPL thing, so read, eval, print, loop. And I'm sure most people are familiar with this. It's just the idea that you have a shell where you can enter commands and you can have them executed and you can see what the results are straight away means you don't have to fire up your IDE, you don't have to create a project, you don't have to start laying out code, you can just start typing in stuff and have it execute. This can be very useful if you want to solve little pieces of problems or puzzles within your application, so you want to work on a small bit and you don't want to have to keep going through the, you know, the complex deployment and comp compilation and so on. So it's good for that. You can do cut and paste from the, the shell into your IDE. Once you've figured out how to solve the problem, you just cut and paste it into the IDE. You can do some scrolling back so you can see, okay, you've tried that approach, that didn't work, go back a bit further, or okay, I've tried that, you know, and then you can figure out what to try next. Um, interestingly, the semicolon is not mandated. This, this was something that came up in, I don't know if any of you saw the Ask Me Anything thing that the uh, virtual jug did the other day. And uh, this was something I learnt, which is that the, the REPL shell doesn't require you to put a semicolon on the end of every line. And so I, I think the semicolon is a much maligned uh, punctuation mark. I think that we should use semicolons more. Uh, maybe not in code. And it uses the compiler API, so it is actually using the compiler behind. It's not doing anything <coughs> clever in terms of interpretation. It is using the compiler. Um, structure of the JDK and the JRE, as I said, has, will be changing. And this has already changed. If you look at uh, latest, well, the builds of JDK 8 at the moment, it, it has changed. So JEP220 specifies what that is. What, we, what they have done is to eliminate the distinction between the JDK and the JRE, because it was a little bit confusing the way that it worked. And it, is it, if you look at uh, the way that the JDK used to be, what you had is a directory, and then within there you'd have a bin directory, which would have Java in it, and it would have various other things, and it would have a JRE directory, which would have a bin directory in it, which would have Java in it. So you had Java in two different places, and it's like, okay, why? Um, and then you had a lib directory, which would have tools.jar, and then the JRE would have a lib directory, which would have rt.jar. So it's, it was a bit kind of messy in terms of the, the JDK. 
that's been resolved, so now we have JDK 9, we have one bin directory which has one copy of Java in it, Java C and so on, there's a lib directory, there is no rt.jar file because this has been modularized, there's no longer an rt.jar file. That has gone away, so has the tools.jar file. Now we have a set of modules. There's also a configuration directory, and this is a nice idea because um, with earlier versions of the JDK, files that you could legitimately change as part of the configuration of both the JDK and the JRE were sort of spread around in different directories. So it wasn't always clear whether it was a file you could edit or you shouldn't edit. So now anything that you could legitimately edit is in the conf directory, and you know that those are things you can change. Uh, a couple of things that are being removed in JDK 9, um, there's an endorsed standard for API override. Um, and the way this works is that if you're writing something like an app server and you want to override some of the, the standard APIs and use things which are specific to your app server, then you can do it using that. Uh, there's also an extension mechanism which is, again, primarily used by app server vendors. These are both going away because with the module system, that doesn't make sense anymore, so they will now be able to use modules, and once the Java EE specification catches up with JDK 9, which is probably some way off, um, then that will, they will be able to use that. A uh, couple of other things, just notable things, because I'm getting towards the end of my time. Um, HTTP2 support, um, that's been around for a while, so that's good. Private methods in interfaces is kind of an interesting um, thing, because, two minutes, good, okay. Yeah, uh, private methods in interfaces. You think to yourself, why would you have a private method in interface? And it doesn't quite make sense. But now it does, because we've in because the introduction of default methods and static methods in interfaces in JDK 8, there's now the idea that you can have private methods so you can actually isolate methods that might be used by a default method or a static method within there. Uh, search capability in the standard API Java docs. This, this is one of the best things that has happened to Java in a long time. Uh, if you try the JDK 9 uh, Java docs now, there's a little search box at the top and you can type in things and you can find things much, much more easily. I just wish they backported to JDK 8. Um, there's discussion about the G1 collector becoming the default garbage collector. I put their hotspot only because I work for a company called Azul. We don't use the G1 garbage collector, so we're not going to be making G1 the default collector anytime soon. Um, and there's some improvements to completable future. So just to summarize and bring it to an end, um, modularization is a big change for the Java platform. So it is changes around the JRE, JDK, rather than the, the language and the APIs themselves. There is some potential disruption around the fact that some internal APIs are going to be encapsulated, so you may need to be aware of that. Use JDEPs to find out whether you do have any dependencies on those. Um, the REPL, JShell, will be quite an interesting thing in order to do quick prototyping. And as I say, there's a, there's a bunch of other small changes which I haven't covered in there here. If you look at the, the JEPs, uh, there's a lot of other ones that are, are covered there. Um, blatant marketing slide coming up here. So since I work for Azul, we have a build of OpenJDK. It is completely free, so it's just a, a binary distribution of the OpenJDK. We take the source code, we build it. Importantly, we run the TCK tests on it. So we make sure that it is a verified version of Java. It is completely free, but of course, we would love to take your money if you want to pay for support on that. Um, also, we're doing embedded versions of this. So we, we had one for the Intel architecture. So you could run it on your Galileo board or your Edison board. And this week, we have just announced at Embedded World that we have a support for ARM 32-bit architectures. And the four most important words of that is requires no licensing fee, which is different to other vendors of embedded JVMs. Further information, openjdk.java.net. Uh, the JEPs are there. Project Jigsaw is there as well. And of course, jcp.org for all the information as the uh, JSRs are built up. And with that, I think I've pretty much hit dead on time. Um, so uh, if there are questions, I suggest we take them out offline um, so that we can get out of the room, or I can get out of the room, so that the next presenter can come and sort himself out. So thank you very much.